one take one story of fashion books and magazines. Just imagine you're a 27 year old, your wife is pregnant, your business is not doing well because perestroika is over, Americans don't care about Russian Soviet Union falling apart. And I, I, I was on Saturday, beautiful Saturday on the flea market, antique flea market. <clears throat> I lost my 25 man network of selling t-shirts a year before because nobody was buying t-shirts. And the peddlers on the street, the Russian boys, they were saying, you know, we're not making money with your t-shirts. Okay, so I need to start a new business. And I was, I got one deal. I sold condoms, condoms, uh, container of condoms. <laughs> You're not going to believe it. Container of condoms got stuck in, in customs in Brooklyn, in Navy Yard. And someone from United Nations organized this shit. They kept the, the container of free condoms, donated condoms to Africa to prevent AIDS. And the guy who was responsible for these condoms started selling them at 10 condoms per cent. So you can buy 10 condoms for a penny. As I speak to him, he's like Indian or Pakistani. And I don't fucking believe it because I can get uh, 50 cents per one in Russia at the port. So basically all I have to do is pay him, ship it to Russia, pay $2,000 for shipping, and the Russians wire me money before I even ship. They give a letter of credit saying, we give you 50 cents per condom. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> but the guy was a corrupt at the United Nations. So, I guess one million Africans got infected with AIDS because of this guy. And me. I understand this is my karma. But the guy sold those, those condoms anyway to somebody else. He actually couldn't sell them. Nobody was buying them. He was complaining. What the hell? <laughs> he lowered the price to the... So, I am uh, on the flea market on... on on 6th Avenue, yes, yeah, 6th Avenue and uh, 19th Street or 20th Street, there was like, you know, garage, garage shit people sell there in New York City. But I was always fascinated by antique books, just me personally. Uh, you know, 17th, 18th century decorations, the paper stinks, I hate it, I keep them in the plastic with salt so there is no humidity no bugs i have a 300 year old kama sutra hand painted erotic illustrations if you know what is kama sutra you probably don't there is no one in the western world who knows the wisdom the mastery of erotic art it has been developed in hinduism in india for over 5000 years so anything you think you know about sex, you're mistaken. You know shit. You know shit about Indian spices during sex that provide stimulation to very sensitive skin. Like you take a spice and it burns a little, but not too much. The other spice burns more. Well, guess what? If you take the spice that doesn't burn a lot and put it in a sensitive spot, you get fucking stimulated. Both women and men. And if you mix it with butter, it stays longer. The, the sensation, the very gentle sensation of spice in your mouth. But it's also a sensation because chemically those spices are supposed to intrigue, uh, stimulate your nerve endings in your mouth. Okay. But they also stimulate nerve endings because this is chemistry, biochemistry. If you don't know fucking biochemistry, you don't know nothing. You won't understand what I'm talking about. So you need PhD in astrophysics <laughs> to understand Bogoslavsky. Going back, so, <clears throat> so there is this guy, this creepy looking guy with Italian accent starts talking to me about those huge portfolio books, $100 each from 19th century with beautiful designs uh, for textiles and wallpapers. You know, wallpapers were, wallpaper was big in Victorian era and in 19th century, they developed, oh my God, 
billions of designs for textiles. Nothing new in the 20th century. No, you think abstract geometric designs? No shit. They, they painted houses in Africa and Mali. For thousands of years, women paint houses, these clay shocks with those paints they have, those clays, <laughs> they're abstract, geometric, better, better than Piet Modrian. You know Piet Modrian, the founder of minimalism, 1920s, 1930s, you know, the boogie woogie painting with all the squares, yellow, white, blue. The minimalism, the essence of fucking visual power, how color works in a painting, a little more blue, different painting, a little more yellow, different ball game. So that's Piet Modrian. But in Africa, they've been doing it for thousands of years. So Piet Modrian didn't discover shit. Matisse didn't discover shit either. Because he saw the paintings of this woman from uh, Libya. Libya, there was a barbar woman who painted like Matisse 20 years before Matisse. So when he saw her in 1905, 1910, he started painting like this. The same goes with Jackson Pollock. He saw this Ukrainian woman a year before Jackson Pollock. We know Peggy Guggenheim. I'm not sure she was fucking Jackson Pollock, but she said, I'll give you a lot of money if you can paint like this on the whole fucking wall of my new museum I'm building on Fifth. And Jackson said, okay, I think I can do this. Not much, you know, fucking splash. So he looks at this Ukrainian woman, I forgot her name, much older lady in 1930s, was painting like Jackson Pollock. But the, her colors were, were happier. They weren't as dramatic. So Pollock didn't have money for paint. He was using car paint, enamel for cars. And the fabric Pollock was using was the cloth painters' houses used for covering the floors. So that's how we got Jackson Pollock and Matisse. They were inspired by someone else. So what happened, uh, it's called in fashion industry, in any industry, it's called product development. I stand on the shoulder of giants. You stand on the shoulder of giants. People who came before and build the fucking pyramid, just think about it. How much mathematics and architectural knowledge it takes to build it so high to make sure the rock at the bottom doesn't get squished as it happened like 50 years at the first pyramid. But how the fuck they figured out how tall it could be not to, not to crumble, not to squish the bottom. I don't know, no fucking idea. Limestone is a, is a chemical composition. I, I, I don't know how they tested. You understand? That was 5,000 years ago. Who the fuck are you? Can't mix your own yellow paint. <laughs> this is ridiculous. You have to make your own paint. Because you tell the collector, give me $5,000, this painting, your grandchildren will inherit. This is forever. That's what you're telling him. Or you're not. Because I say... This painting will be in the museum 100 years from now as the most important symbol of our civilization. That's what I say. And this is my objective. This is my life goal. Okay, going back to fashion. So this guy and I start talking to uh, about antique books. I need a drink. So he says he's a manager of a big bookshop in Milan, in Italy. Not an Ovner, I think he lied about that. His name, last name was Andrea. My first name is Andre. So it's this weird acquaintance out of the blue. And he tells me his customers that he personally talks to are the most famous fashion designers and their art directors. We're talking about Chanel House, all the Europeans, all the fashion labels you heard of and you probably never heard of because dresses are $20,000 and they're custom made, one of a kind. That's where my wife shops and my girlfriend. The point is that as I was talking to him, he started saying he would like to have a friend in the United States who would go to flea markets, who is interested in antique books, 
who will buy something for him, he will send me a list by fax, right? Find me those books. Because those, those Dolce Gabbana, I don't know who the fuck they are. I don't give a shit who they are, actually. Louis Vuitton designers, they want that book. And it's only one was published, never reprinted. Like Banana Republic had a book with their watercolors. When they started their catalog, Banana Republic, they, it used to be watercolor catalog, but ultimately they pu pu published the hardcover book and it was called Banana Republic book. And this la years later, this art director of Versus, not Versace, but Versus, this tall Korean American, very handsome, he worked in Paris, flew to New York to meet me, and he told me about... No, 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 it was the opposite. I bought this fucking book for $10 on the street from a Polish book bender. It was years later, right? Years after I met this Italian. So you know what's going to happen. So this guy from Versus, this Asian guy, American, he, he says, oh my God, I have to have this book. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know how much to charge. He says, I'll give you $1,000. I immediately thought $10 and $1,000. I immediately thought maybe Ralph Lauren, a personal acquaintance, will pay more. So I told him, I'll call you back. He says, I'm in a hotel. I came here just for to visit your shop. I'm flying back tomorrow to Paris. And he's the head design director for Versus which is the sports active wear of Versace. I'm not sure it's still around. It was back in 1995, two years after I met the Italian guy. So the Italian guy says, and he keeps talking that those fashion designers, unlimited corporate budgets, they need to do research, they need the latest photography books, like uh, photographers go in the wild. They go to tribes, they go to Africa, they photograph those houses in Mali I was talking to you about. And they they make those books, those coffee table books. And I didn't realize, I never thought about it, but that's how it works. The very famous top designers' houses, they need to design something super duper original. Their sources need to be literally root, root, root grass. Grass roots in America, they say, like the bottom like the dirt of the soil. This is where they get inspired. They are not inspired by your dress. They don't give a shit you created special zipper. Well, they might. They might steal your idea for the zipper, right? But they are the leaders. They're going to invest billion dollars in these shoes, for instance. Well, who's going to buy those shoes? Are they going to be trendy? What is trendy? What's going to be trendy next year? Dolce Gabbana think to himself. Oh, maybe Amazon tribe teams. Maybe. Do we have any books about it? I'll buy all the fucking books first. The latest, the newest. Because when you look at the book from 20, 30 years ago, photography, uh, <laughs> it's not current. It looks like a piece of shit. Just look at those books from 30 years ago. I mean, they have this uh, stench and beauty about those colors of this color photographs from 1980s. But you immediately recognize it's not today's photography. And this is not what the designers want. I mean, the big ones. But in America, it's even better. There are 18,000 companies, and every one of them became my customer in the period of three years, as you can imagine. And they, okay, we've got to finish this.